everybody. My name is Mark. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Mark S. King, and I want to welcome you to an occasional series of Out on Film called In Conversation, where we get the opportunity to speak to some of the people behind some of the best queer cinema available. Everybody's favorite queer uh, uh, film festival, Out on Film, of course, in Atlanta. Today, we have the co-directors of the documentary All Man, the International Male Story. Now, this, uh, this feature is playing Sunday, October 1st at 5.30 p.m. at Outfront Theater. We hope to see you there, but if not, it will begin streaming on Out on Film the next day. For more information, you can always visit outonfilm.org for tickets, for information, and to see interesting uh, backstory conversations like this one. So before we go any further, I really got to welcome the two of you, Jesse Reed and Brian Darling, the co-directors of All Man. Welcome, y'all, to Atlanta. Thank oh, you. thank you. It's thank it's nice to virtually be in Atlanta. <laughs> yes. <I know. laughs> yes. Well, we're we're so glad to have you and for you to agree to do this. You know, uh, for those who don't know, tell everybody a little bit about what the hell was this international mail thing anyway. <laughs> well, uh, international mail was a men's mailer fashion catalog. Uh, you know, think of Sears and. Any of these things uh, uh, back, uh, let's see, from about the 1972 uh, until around, I think, 2006, six seven, And um, it was a way in which you could order clothing. Um, it was completely geared towards men. Um, there were a few items for women sprinkled here and there. Um, but generally speaking, it was the first that we can really tell of brand devoted to men that crossed into the mainstream and offered men a very um, sexy way to present themselves and express themselves uh, that had not been available to men prior to International Mail. Well, you know, Brian, you mentioned Sears, and I do remember being a lad and looking at the uh, jockey underwear pages of Sears magazine, mm -hmm. but that was nothing compared to what International Mail presented to the public, because you had buffed out men where, oh, by the way, I'm wearing the most International Mail thing I could find in my closet. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I so appreciate but, that. There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. This <laughs> is way too much clothing for what I was focused on in an International Mail, which were hot, nearly naked men men uh, in thongs and caftans and all sorts of what we would call metrosexual today. I feel as if the international male kind of got the whole metrosexual thing going. Totally. We totally agree with you. And funny enough, it started with underwear. It started with this jock sock that Gene saw in a medical uh, medical supply store when he was walking down the street in London. And he took that and he's like, I can take this underwear and make something that all men will want. And I think it was a bit of a shock for him when the orders started pouring in, people so eager. I mean, underwear operates a special place in our society, especially back then, because you could sort of get away with pretty sassy underwear and no one would have to know about it versus clothing you wear on the sort of exterior of the body. So I think it was it was a curious gateway for a lot of men to become more expressive, let's say. You know, you're talking about Gene Burkhardt, who was the founder of International Mail, and him looking at these jock straps. And I remember watching the movie going, why didn't anybody think of that before? He was the Betsy Ross of jock straps. You know, he, <laughs> he, saw, this, he saw this very utilitarian garment and said, I can dress this up and make it sexy. He was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I mean absolutely. That's what he was. He was definitely like a visionary. I mean, the, Gene, Gene, more than anything, was an inventor. You know, he wasn't a business person. He, uh, you know, he would see an idea, have an idea, and then and then was really actually so impressive of how he could take this idea and manifest it and make it real. And what is so great is he had no clue how to do it, yet he'd go out and find people to do it. And it wasn't like you'd go out to a big manufacturer. He put an ad in the paper for seamstresses to, and he'd just get people at home who could basically hand sew and stitch and make these 
pieces of underwear back at the beginning and uh to the point where at the very beginning you know everybody was working out of his uh beach shack in ocean beach with uh literally like you know planks for flooring <laughs> you could see through you know yeah, there's, uh, a, there's, ahead, a uh, there's a famous story early on that gloria likes to tell i just saw her recently who was uh sort of gene's right hand and also like the vice president of the company and she came on very early and when the orders started pouring in for that jock sock she asked the seamstress sort of on staff if you will or who worked daily like how many of these can you make a day and she she said eight and they were like okay we need to scale this up really fast because yeah. like eight is not it's going to be the end of the year before they fill the first day's worth of orders you know and, and you know that was only the beginning i mean and obviously it grew and grew and grew even faster as your documentary shows faster than they were able to keep up with you know this whole this whole the, the explosion of it into this slick magazine that i am of an age that remember getting this in my mailbox and the excitement of going through it to see your documentary, why is it that I and so many people, the friends of mine that watch this documentary with me, why do we have such affection for this magazine? What is it about this magazine that we all go, oh yeah, yeah, you know, why? Why do we feel that way about it? The thing that, I, I mean, I think to, there's twofold. I mean, we're talking about the analog world where representation was really limited. We saw what was on TV, we saw what was in our, our local cities paper and we saw what we saw in movies and there wasn't a lot of representation that was sort of outside the box so to speak i mean that's arguable at times but what the brilliance of gene was and what was so intentional in some ways was not to make it just about sex it was to provide people with this window where they could imagine themselves in it and for me as a young queer person who also got this it was like this fantasy world. It was like this place and it didn't say gay, it didn't say straight. It just was an opportunity to sort of project myself into it. And that's some really powerful stuff when, depending on when you came out during these sort of analog years of like the 70s through the 90s, I mean, having representation that wasn't, you know, for me, for me, coming out in the middle of the AIDS crisis, you know, it was really powerful and it was really freeing to sort of picture myself in it. And I think that's what's so special. The converse of that is for straight men and their their female friends or, or lovers or girlfriends or wives. It was an opportunity to sort of take a risk and sort of say, well, well, Don Johnson's doing it. Well, Fabio's doing it. Why can't I do it, too? I love in the movie how they talk about how it be, it did appeal to not as much straight men as their girlfriends who were dragging them down the street in West Hollywood to the international mail store that would eventually open uh, there on Santa Monica Boulevard. And the, the, all, the number of straight women that were like, I want my boyfriend in that. I want him wearing that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think that it, I mean, you know, people often make fun of the fashion, like, like, oh, it wasn't real fashion. And Gene, you know, sort of bristled at that. He really wanted to reach mainstream America. And I think that the price point, you know, you could take the risk without, you know, going to like a Barney's type store or some fancy retailer. I mean, this was, you know, it wasn't cheap, I'd say, but it was it was possible to do it. And I think it gave people a lot of permission. That's what that's a phrase we would say over and over again when we would make the film. It was like, there was like a permission that came along with it to try something out. Yeah. Yeah, I think like when you, well, one thing to just to build off that is, I mean, you know, men, men in general, uh, you know, had not, been able to really express their sexuality you know to express sexuality uh was largely and and still is to a degree looked at as a feminine thing you know sort of you know and i think you know, women want sexy men you know they have desire to and and i think it's said really well by dale uh, who was a stylist in the film um by what he says where is 
the the women uh, you know the men wanted it and the women got it for their men you know mm-hmm. and i i think ultimately it's it's not that men you know it's that weird thing that you go back and forth with which is you want something but also you're like no that's bad or i shouldn't do that or what will people think of me or how will i be perceived but you still really want it you know and that was what was great about the, you know what international mail did and uh you know thanks for women you know, <laughs> it, you know it was a cultural force the magazine was a cultural force. And even if you didn't end up buying something from that magazine, like you say, it gave me permission to go buy something kind of like it, you know, that I could find in the small town that I lived in, you know, if I was too scared to order the magazine. There's so much great storytelling in this movie about the, the kind of ragtag band of misfits that, that Gene collects to, to drive this, this company, this international male company. At the beginning of the movie, they say it's about a family. And I'm like, well, okay, we'll see. Family, really? You know, uh, and you make the case. You make the case that it is, and you really get to know these this collection of people, and you got to wonder, where would they have been without it if they hadn't been invited into this family? You know, they, you know, these were marginalized people, a lot of them, gays, queers, etc. You know, where would they have been otherwise? And they found a home at this company where they could thrive. I thought that there was something just adorable about that. Yeah, it's really surreal if you think about it. I mean, you know, it's easy to look back at the time also in, in the 1970s and the 1980s, especially, and think, wow, you know, it was such a dark time to be gay and it got it would be so awful back then. Yet at the same time, you see this world in which everybody is allowed to be completely who they are. I mean, more even some ways the things they did and said to each other are more so than anything people say and do to each other today. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I think ultimately it, it's, you know, it's, it's funny when you say make a case for it because it, there was no, for us, there was no case to be made. It literally was this family and everybody is still so close today. Um, you know, they have a Facebook page, they keep in touch with one another. Um, they continually oh. share stories and relive memories and they have so many photographs. And, you know, we were recently at Jean's Memorial uh, and it was a reunion. So many people flew in, the film was playing that evening and to have person after person come up and share how, you know, Jean and international mail changed their lives, influenced them. But, you know, I remember one particular woman, you know, they, they, so many of the stories were, they had very little experience or very little, you know, uh, they just got this job, applied for this thing. They didn't really have a lot of experience. And Jean would literally talk to them as far as who they are, what they're doing. And she realized later that, he was figuring out where they were going to be in 10 or 15 years within the company and then helping them get there and then helping them make sure that they were able to, you know, pay their bills and raise their children and have time off. And, you know, I mean, yeah, I don't Jess, you want to take it from there? No, no. I mean, I, yeah, Brian, like underscored, you know, in making this film, we were welcomed into this family and like we would learn so much about about these people. I mean, there's so much on the cutting room floor. It was so painful. But what I want to say is like, I think part of what's so powerful is the evolution of all these characters in the story of the models, these sort of archetypes of masculinity, if you will, whose paradigm shifted through participating in this. Like, the 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 women who had maybe never had a job or Gloria who was not able to type you know becoming like the head buyer there's something so fantastical and sort of innocent about this Mm -hmm. this sort of nascent industry that Jean built um that's really magical we all I, I always joke it's an American success story too it's not the American success story you hear but it was like He built this thing in this community that was so powerful. And at the memorial, like even the mayor of San Diego came, like the current mayor of San Diego to like introduce 
you know, and it's funny to see this sort of lasting impact this this figure had in San Diego. Wow. I think just one thing I want to add to that, which is, you know, when you look at um, the fact that so many of these people were very new, they weren't they weren't necessarily, you know, they didn't have bachelors or masters in design and in fashion or in so many things, especially early on in this period of the seventies and eighties. And I think it just a testament to what happens when you believe in people and you really support them. And, and I think that that to me is one of the big lessons of taking the film that I, I hope is how you look at people and try to support people and find ways to build them up, and, you know? You know, what I keep hearing in my head as you were talking about all of that is becoming your best self and giving people the space they mm. need to be their very best self. And you hear that today, you hear that in the Trevor Project, you hear that on RuPaul's Drag Race, but those are messages that we're allowed to say today. The culture's caught up to a point where we can. Gene was telling this to people 40 years ago. You know, I, I I mean, it's there's just something so moving about that. I, um, you know, any long term HIV survivor like myself, we know that you can't tell a story from, of the 80s without AIDS, you know, encroaching somehow. And the moment in which the the, the film in which it does encroach um, knocked me down like a ton of bricks. Now, you know, you might say, ah, you know, I cry at anything that has to do. No, I, I um, I'm I'm walled up. And yet when this family is struck by AIDS, the, the, the portion, and it's not, it's not exploitative, you don't go on and on about it, but my God, there's a moment where you see the loss and it's heartbreaking. Editing that um, was probably, is in my opinion, the most important scene for me editing in, that, in the film. Um, and from the standpoint of editing and directing that it, it I actually dreaded it the most um, in a way I, I feel like, you know, and this could be a generational thing and, and I don't even know what it's like for people that are in their twenties now, but I dread any time AIDS is going to come up in a film. And the reason why is because it has been, it has been, there's so many stories that have been told complete films about it elements you're right you it is inescapable and and rightly so you know there's no reason not to so but when i came to it i'm like oh there's always the same five clips that get used there's always the same elements to the story you know we didn't know what it was so it was like how can we tell this story in a way that's you know new and i don't want to sound like egotistical but that was the thing like how can we tell this it's fresh so it was from the perspective of these people and my the the goal with it and we had a big talk about this was always this thing between the macro and the micro so what's happening nationally culturally in large swaths and then what is happening in san diego what is happening specifically with this group of people and obviously it's going to be told through their perspective but even more so, a lot of the decisions that went into that were around trying to only show once you announced here's the you know the the section the beat about AIDS. The big thing was okay, what is San Diego going through, and what are these people like? So showing things that were on the news in San Diego, showing images of what things were like, because this is what they were seeing and what they were experiencing, and to keep it very very focused on this family because I think that experience is what is unique you know and and that was the goal of it at least from from my perspective I know Sh Jesse shares that as well I don't know if you want to add to yeah. that Jess no no I would just echo everything Brian eloquently said like the you know starting the macro and then it just eases right into the micro with like a caller calling and then it's like suddenly the story is coming inside. I think Brian and I always shared this vision of sort of being in love with the fact that it was San Diego. It wasn't New York, it wasn't LA, it wasn't even mm -hmm. Chicago, it was or Atlanta, it was San Diego, you know, and that there's this there's this uh, basically like PBS footage that we got where there's a guy in the mall and 
he's being sort of candidly asked, you know, at the height, sort of mid 80s, like, you know, what should we do? And he's saying that everyone should be quarantined. And there's something so pedestrian about him being in this mall and sort of saying this. And it's not even said in like a sort of malicious way. It's just such a document of that moment in our culture of what people were processing. And then to see these actual faces follow him of actual people that the company lost in the same city who maybe had gone to the same mall. It was incredibly powerful what Brian did yesterday, I think. You know, um, so I'm totally on board about this being about family and a family that succeeded and a family had pro these two parental figures who lifted them all up and let them do their best work. Some of my favorite parts of the movie are about the backstage, back scenes of how they made the magazine, the photo shoots. Can you imagine? The, well, you can't imagine. You've learned all about them. We as the viewer get to see all that stuff in terms of where they did the photo shoots and the models, a lot of them who are straight and are bros and are <laughs> hilarious. They are such good sports yeah. about, yeah, I was wearing this outfit. And, you know, when we're smiling in it, it's because we're laughing at what we were wearing. But we're cool. <laughs> you know, they were great. I, I loved them. Um, I encourage anyone to go see this movie for us for a slice of life. I'm so glad uh, that you brought this story um, to the rest of us. I'm, I'm proud of uh, out, in, uh, out on film in Atlanta that we get to, to show it with, with the public. And, and I, I wish you both the best with this film. Uh, Y'all, if you want to see this movie, you be sure to go to Out on Film on Sunday, October 1st at 5.30 p.m. at Outfront Theater. It will be available for streaming on the very next day. If you don't get those opportunities, then you go find this film and you go search for it and you grab it like the last gay jockstrap on the rack because you <laughs> see Oh, man. <laughs> Jesse, uh, Brian, y'all are terrific. I'm very happy for your success. Everybody else, you. this has been Out on Film in Conversation with the co-directors, Jesse Reed and Brian Darling of All Man. Y'all, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.